So you're great. Whew. And we are live, ladies and gentlemen, in the last possible moment. The well-oiled machine of Bretsky and Hunter managed to pull it out. We were unable to hear Carl, and then all of a sudden we were. And this is primarily due to my technological ineptitude because the great Betty Sue is off on the road, on tour with James McMurtry, driving somewhere between, oh, where was it? Baton Rouge and Mobile. I'm going to shut off my phone now because I've left her several panic messages to help me. Uh, and she will probably call in the middle of this and then we'll have incredible feedback. Anyway, welcome to the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. Thank we you. Are, we are so thrilled to have today with us the great Carl Bretsky, who is wearing the correct T-shirt, I see. How are you, Carl? Hey, great. Thank you. Awesome. Exhausted trying to get our sound to work, but otherwise great. It, it, well, the thing that's great about that is we didn't have a chance to talk beforehand. I know. I always get you start talking about things, then you can't remember if you've talked about it live or not. So uh, anyway, we, we are here, we are unrehearsed, and we are going to plow into the mystery that is Carl Bretsky. <laughs> Carl, give us a quick overview. Where did you come from? I know you're one of these, most of us planner artists are like graphic designers who aged out of graphic design. You, on the other hand, were a doctor. Yeah, but I mean, I think early on we were all the same. I was a an art nerd in school, so right. Um, I just ended up taking the easy way out and picking medicine. So, right, and you did that for a while, and then what led to you deciding to go into the much more lucrative field of of painting? Well, I mean, like I said, I, I've done it since high school or grade school or whatever, and always loved it, and then. I happened to marry an artist, my lovely wife, Christy. And uh, it was about 20 years ago, she was taking some classes from Joe Paquette, who's in our community. And uh, she said, you know, if you want to get back into your art, maybe you should take some classes from Joe because he's kind of, you know, kind of a straightforward realist kind of painter. And that's the kind of art that I like. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So you took a class from Joe, and then you said, I'm going to do this for, for a living. I mean, it's walking through the doorway of deciding to do this for with, with one's life is, is something that I like discussing a lot on this because most of our audience are people who have a passion for art but have chosen other, other, other ways of putting food on the table and are now kind of flirting with the idea of doing more and more art as a way of making a living. What caused you to walk through that doorway? Um, you know, it's, I think all of us just end up having a passion for art as we go through it. Right. And it was just an itch I couldn't scratch when I was working full time in medicine. And so it was 20 years ago, I took classes for like 12 years with Joe and right. then Every moment I had, vacations, weekends, whatever, I was painting. And I think the beauty of having someone mentor you early on is you kind of see you kind of see the entrance to it all. I, I had no idea plein air painting was out there. I, I didn't really even know much really about oil painting or studio painting. But having seen other people then go through it, I kind of see, yeah, you know, I could do that and enjoy it and uh, but again, it comes down to passion. I, I just couldn't think of anything else for a while. Uh huh. Uh huh. And and and, so how long have you been doing this? Twenty-two uh, years, I think. Twenty-two years, full time. I met you at um, Door County, I believe. Uh, I actually, knowing we were going to talk, I made a list of all the places that you and I have been together, and it's it's a dozen places probably. Really? Yeah. What, 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 if you've got the list, what, what are some of them? Door County, yeah. Smoky Mountains, Lighthouse Plein Air, Conventions, one, two, three, Texas Plein Air. I guess it isn't 10. Right. But <laughs> that's, a that's, that's, that's a good one, that Texas one. Are you doing Texas this year? No, I haven't done it for a couple of years now. Right. I'm it, going back. I didn't get in last year. They, they wouldn't let me in. They, I wasn't Texan enough. Um, is, I, I, it's humbling and good. It's very good. It's very good not to get into an event. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, but one of the things that you're famous for in the plein air world 
is your nocturnes, your, your evening paintings. Is that something that you are still, I've always said, I'm gonna stop doing the monochrome paintings when I'm bored with them. But right. it feels like I am still learning so much in doing them. Um, is that similar how it is for you uh, with, with, your, with your night paintings? I think so. I think all these things that we do that are kind of uh, told that that's us, I think they're just little subspecialties within our our art repertoire that, that we get kind of good at, and then it's hard to let go of it. It's hard to let go of it, but it also, my ongoing metaphor for what we do is that we're storytellers, and we find the language that works best for us. Yeah, there's a commercial element to it because if we're good at telling a story that way, it gets accepted. Yeah. And I think then you have to not be doing it for the sake of revenue, but still be doing it for the sake of this is the best way that I tell the story. No, I definitely agree that the minute you're doing something for the revenue, it's you will not be successful. Yep. Right? I'm doing that right now. I have one, I have a big painting in my studio that I was like, I'm going to do a barn with a dramatic sky for my show in October. It's a terrible painting, Carl. It's a terrible painting. I get that. Um, but like the night scenes, and so I, I really studied the physics of light and color. I've, I got, I've got a book from some really nerdy. Uh, a physicist that kind of spells it all out and I keep trying to find these things then in my paintings and it's become almost half the fun of it for me and so I kind of took that to the next level I did a video on nocturnes and I did a video on sunsets and so now any chance I get to paint those things it's just fun I, I can uh -huh. obsess for hours over how light dims and changes color as it moves away from a light source and wow. it's all physics and and yet you put it down the way it's supposed to happen and it looks correct well let's 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 start looking at some examples of this all right let's dive into the beauty of the work that is carl brett's i mean and your work is stunning your work is stunning carl i i I love it. I have not seen this piece in, in person, but... Uh, yeah, this was a bigger piece. This is the studio piece for... I've done probably three plein air pieces of Wilson's. It's a Shake Shack and a hamburger joint down in Ephraim, Wisconsin. Absolutely iconic. I mean, it's right paint. on the road. Everybody, when you first time you go to Door County, you say, oh, I'm going to paint that. And then you realize everybody has painted that. Exactly. But not everybody paints it at night. And so... Uh, that's another advantage of doing these night scenes. You get work that other people aren't doing, which uh, anytime you can stand out as different, I think that's good. So my difference here was that I painted it at night. And again, I'm paying attention to that fall off of light uh, and the glow around lights at night. And um, it turns out I was there painting this scene earlier and I stuck around to eat a hamburger, I think, and came out just as they closed. And this waitress, the last waitress came walking out and I just thought it was such a stunning image. So that's called The Last Waitress, it's 30 by 40. Yeah, now, now so so did you ask her to, did you snap a photo of it or is I this- snapped her on the cross uh, I'm sorry? I just snapped a photo of her and one other waitress walking across the street and I just kind of focused in on her Right. So it's this is a was this painting done for Door County? So it's primarily a plein air painting with the figure inserted. No, this painting was done for uh, my gallery in Sag Harbor, New York. So it 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 it, it was this is a, stu a studio piece, exactly. but but drawing on your extensive plein air experience. Yes. Do you, do you view your plein air stuff as as basically field notes for studio paintings, or do you, do you view them as two separate beasts that have some Venn diagram overlap? Um, it's uh, twofold. If I don't have time to do something and I know I have time in the studio to finish it, 
as opposed to a plenary event, for instance. Right. If I'm, so an example was this year, I'm part of the Catalina Wildside Art Show uh, 10 artists, and they bring you out to the island and you paint for a few days, and then you go back to your studio and you touch up your paintings, you can do some studio work from those. So those planner pieces I kind of considered as, uh, as uh, sorry, I just got distracted by a message. Um, those I consider as uh, studies for bigger pieces. Okay. But when I'm at a plenary event, of course, you hang your plenary work. And so I try to get my plenary piece as finished as I can. And right. whether it means I go back a second night, which it sometimes does, or second day, I'll do that. But yeah, those are all finished plenary works. Cool. Well, James Galbraith, um, who has a show, I believe, opening in, uh, in Plano, Texas tonight, uh, or sometime very, very soon. But James says that this is your Nighthawks at the diner. But it's only one Nighthawk, James. Only yes. one Nighthawk. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, when I was a little kid, my aunt was into art. She lived in Minneapolis, and we were in a small town in Minnesota. And every month or so, our mothers would trade kids. So we'd go in and go to the art museums with my aunt. And they had a lot of hoppers at um, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. So I saw a bunch of walkers, and I ended up with Nighthawks poster in my bedroom as a little kid. Really? Do you think that has informed almost, you know, subconsciously your maybe. aesthetic? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I, I I think that stuff really plays a big role. I mean, I I was rereading uh, Robert Lawson's uh, Robert McCloskey's Homer Price. He also did Make Way for Ducklings, and his drawings. Homer Price work, lives at a gas station in Ohio, and his drawings are all sepia. And I bet that has a whole, you know, somewhere Quite, uh, in my brain my, you know, that, that yeah. registered. So interesting. Yeah. Now, now here we here we have one of your sunset paintings, and talk a little talk a little about how how you made these color decisions. Um, so I really do try to paint what I see. But interestingly, I never used to see it until I knew what was going to happen. And so by studying the sequence of sunset and the reason you see those colors that you do, this was much easier to see. And this is a plein air piece, a little nine by 12 from the west coast of Florida. And uh, I ended up looking for a cloud formation that I liked and I do a little outline of the, where the clouds are. And then I put in this background sky color, which is this normal parfait from, from uh, red to orange to yellow to green to blue, with the lightest area being the yellow-green zone. Okay. And put that in the background, and then you put in the color that you see in the clouds, you've completed essentially your sunset image. And then you just got to get the color notes correct on the ground. And the surprising part to me was I, I'm pretty sure that if I had tried to paint this in the studio, I wouldn't have gotten the greens quite as green in that water, but that is exactly how it looked to me plein air. So, so there is a lot of honesty, I think, in, in doing things like this plein air, at least getting your colors in. You can always refine shapes later. but Right. Well, I think, I think that is fascinating. I mean, because this does have a, it's almost like a journalistic verisimilitude that you've got going on with, with the colors because they are really unexpected. Yeah. You know, but but they ring true, and especially I just want to point out the way you subtly reference the color notes in the sky, in the greens on the left in the water, and by staring at those greens, that makes the blue, uh, the blue of the sand, really have resonance. Um, it pops off then. Whoa, that that that's magnificent, Carl. Put your finger across that that water. The painting kind of just disappears to me. Yeah. Yeah. There's another thing, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, let me just toss in here some very smart uh, compositional decisions that Mr. Bretsky has made. Please note the John Twachman like uh, reeds coming out of those beach grasses mm -hmm. that they stitch both from the land through the water and up into the sky that stitches the three component pieces of the painting together as do the figures you know but but i think those i think the uh, foliate uh it's natural world 
stitching the, the, the elements together as opposed to the human element stitching it. Really smart design there, Carl. Yeah, and I know we're saying the same thing, but I, I was taught early on, uh, I have a lot of friends obviously in the paint world, and I think it was Ben Fenske told me to never leave a horizontal line alone. You've got to always cross it with something. You've got to break it some way. If it goes all the way across your painting, you've got to cross it. Yeah, I think the eye skids off. The eye skids off the page, or the it looks the like two paintings. I think if you if you don't, yeah, propose something. All right, next slide, please. Another plein air piece. This was when I was kind of studying to do the sunset video, and at the same time, it was a plein air event up in the northern suburb of Minneapolis, uh, but. This is what I would consider golden hour, where you still see the sun above the horizon. And that's when you get those really nice um, uh, colors in the superimposed darks. It's essentially what it is, it's light that spills over in your eyes so that those green leaves look orange up against the bright sun. Uh, I don't know if that's a little too complex, but. No, that is not too complex. Yeah. Get a kick out of that, and I think if you look at a lot of people's paintings of sun near the horizon, you'll see a lot of that kind of work where they're trying to do a prismatic shift from yellow to orange to red as you move away from the glare of the sun. Now, now as someone who works monochromatically or very, very low chroma in plein air work, how do you keep how do you keep your colors from muddying? You can't, I mean, is yeah. it discipline on the palette? Is it discipline on the, on, the, on the surface? Is it a mixture of both? How do you do it? Well, it's a mixture of things. Um, first of all, I guess most importantly, don't keep changing your mind or don't keep chasing the light. If I had chased the light here, uh, it would eventually turn to be kind of a gray mess. So um, I kind of put in the clouds when I, they're at the position that I like them at. I had done uh, a silhouette of the landmass in advance. Okay. Uh, but any, on, on, on your painting surface, you've done a silhouette of the landmass? Okay. Yep. But I did that of the large masses. Anything small that's just a line, like these branches that go through the, the sunlit part behind the tree, those uh, I pull in at the end. You can, you can easily drag a real fine line through wet paint, but. Right to uh, paint around each of those branches, it would be harder to do. Well, but the fine line that you're pulling through the paint there is, I'm, I'm looking at the line that goes through the brightest, you know, yellowish white of the, uh, whitish yellow of the setting sun. Yeah. That line is actually like an orange. Exactly. Orange. You've got yeah. to get that color exactly right before you drag that brush through. Yeah, you, I mean, you have a couple chances at it. It's oil paint, but still, but still. Uh, I do know that when you're looking at something silhouetted against something that bright, that light just kind of eats away at that dark structure and turns it closer to the color that the light is. Yeah. So in this case, orange closer to yellow than green would be. Amazing, amazing yeah. work. Okay, shifting a little now, uh, we're going into the chilly scenes of winter. I'm going to take us up to the side there. That's almost a Charlie Hunter. Yeah, I, that's one resonates with me, I'll tell you that. Yep. So, um, obviously, a lot less color. This was painted plein air until I got too cold and I went back in the studio and I think I refined the figures or popped some new figures in or whatever. But I really am a nut for this these tonal changes that you see with distance. So uh, that's what this was about. And against this dark kind of very slate gray, almost stormy sky in winter, which we get up here quite a bit in Minnesota. So yeah, I guess it was the, the tonalism that, that caught my eye and uh, a loose narrative. There's ice fishermen on the water. The other thing is that to Minnesotans, it's a very familiar scene. Uh -huh. And I think familiarity is overlooked in, in art. I think that anytime you can create something that someone else goes, oh, yeah, that reminds me of this or something, 
I think that's, I think you're doing people a favor if you bring back memories and such. Right. Well, I mean, okay. So, so that is, that's, that's kind of a, a very pre-modern modernist way of looking at things. I mean, the, the idea of kind of uncomplicated sentiment is we are, we are taught to kind of shy away from that. And you're saying you don't see anything wrong with fully embracing that. Well, I don't think I do it to, um, I don't do it necessarily for the viewer as much as for myself. Ah, okay. And then I think the viewer relates to it. Right, okay, okay. So, so this is something really common to me that I enjoy to look at. Right. And, and, and it still, it still feels good to have other people say, yeah, right. you know, just what you're, what you're doing there. It's just exactly how it looks. Right. Or exactly how it feels. I, I, you know, I can feel, I can feel that 4 PM, you know, the light is, it's starting to it's that midwinter, those short, short days. Right. Uh, but the, the thing I want to point out here is you're really masterful uh, application of or how you did the tree trunks because they are present but they're not fussy yeah you 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 really know when to when to put the pedal to the metal and when to lay off the accelerator you're really good at that well that's interesting that you said that because i probably redid those trunks about 10 times i would think they would be the toughest thing to do because they're not they're not the locus of the painting right they're extremely important but getting getting the balances exactly right i yeah you want to suggest it so that it's not too obvious and yet right. it can't be so abstract that people don't know what it is so. right exactly next slide please oh this is nice <laughs> okay that's uh this was in tequesta florida which you're aware that's lighthouse plein air yeah and um, I actually did a nocturne workshop there before the event. And I did this scene as a, I think a nine by, or 11, 14 study. And then I, I sold it and I liked it enough. And I liked my images from that day. So I brought, brought that home and uh, did a big piece. This is 2436, again, for my New York studio art gallery. And um, if you look at it, it's got, all these interesting colors of light and light sources. Yeah. And, and I get such a kick out of that. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the thing that, that I find really enjoyable about it is you have the naturalistic, the moon, the moon's realm up there is one world of light. Yeah. And you've got the mercury vapor, the orangey light, and then the, the greens, there's that guy who does the photography out in the Mojave Desert um, of like a, a empty trailers, and they often have that kind of startling, kind of arsenic green. That's yeah, that's the, uh, I think that one is terrible for memory. Don't. Uh, but then, the, then the neon, the blue neon, it's it's just these like four different worlds, uh, at all juxtaposed with one another. Yeah, I think the other, th the other thing you'll find is I put vehicles in my paintings quite a bit, and to me they're they make it look more real, <laughs> and it also gives it a little bit of scale, like it's like putting a figure in. Yeah, and everyone knows exactly how tall those cars should be. So, right. Well, now the, the one of the things I like about this is that it, it has almost a pastiche quality to it because the the worlds of light don't really at least in my looking at it now and explain to me if i'm looking at it in, incorrectly but they they seem to have kind of a dominion to themselves that, that they are the the blue realm the orangey realm the natural moonlight realm was that a conscious decision to keep them isolate or is it is 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 that a reasonable depiction of what the reality was. Well, I think that um, in general, artificial light at night, there's not a lot of spillover of color between one and the other because the light doesn't travel very far. Okay. So to me, it was more a matter of how to lay it out compositionally so that it feels like a balanced painting. Right. 
And so my eye goes to that red neon, but it's kind of balanced in the upper outer third on the other side with the moon. Right. And then the rest is your eye just kind of keeps following where the rest of the lights are. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, now the light, the orangey light in the sky. Yeah. Tell us a little about the physics on, on that. Cause that goes from, or, or the color choices you made there. Cause you're going from, you know, the, right. the light source to that kind of reddish glow into the blue of the clouds. Right. So I don't want to lose anybody, but this is a, it's a prismatic color shift and it's actually occurring in your eye. And it's going from a short wavelength yellow light to a longer wavelength red light as you move away from that light source. And as it superimposes over the darks behind it, it starts to blend with those darks. So near the light source, I'll start blending a little bit of orange with that cloud color. And as I move out, I'll move shift it to more of a reddish color mixed with the cloud. And then finally, maybe alizarin even mixed with the cloud. So that if you just sampled a bit of that cloud behind the orange light, you would see some some form of red or orange in it, but it's not going to be just orangey yellow. If you did, if I just took orangey yellow, the color of that light and filtered it into that dark behind it, it would turn to be kind of an ugly gray. Yes. that And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, Charles Hunter has never become a noted nocturne painter. It's <laughs> exactly what he does. That's precisely what I wanted you to do, Carl Bretzky. I wanted you to get into the, into the, that world of knowledge that you you have. So feel free. We're a bunch of nerds. We're all nerds at this table. Okay. So uh, this is great. <clears throat> all right. Next slide, please. A little change. A little change yes. here. I, I had to prove that I can paint during the day too. So this is um, a plein air piece from the Catalina Island Wild Site Art Show last year, and uh, I, I, we took. Uh, couple cars across the wild side of the island. I, I had Cindy Barron and Shauna Coons and John Butison were with me. And we would make stops along the way and I would just do a small piece. This is an eight by 10 uh, and bring those back to the studio. If I wanted to do a bigger one, then I could. Um, it also reminds me of the colors of the day if I wanted to do a studio piece. So this is one of the smaller pieces I did, but uh, I, I liked it because it was both tonal and it had some interesting color mm -hmm. so 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 in, in your plein air rig what is how many how many tubes do you carry with you <clears throat> all right so i got my palette from joe paquette and uh it's classically it's been called the prismatic palette and so it's a lot more colors than a lot of people would put out um and i'm not sure if i started over again and had someone other than Joe that I would have decided to use that many colors, but I go from white to cad yellow light, cad yellow, cad orange, cad scarlet, cad red. So those are the warm colors and you can see how easy it is for me to go back and forth in a night scene then from yellow to red. I just right. got the palette. And then the cool colors, I go from a manganese blue to cobalt blue to ultramarine blue and then violet. And then as a modifier, I have black on my palette. You do. And Is I, it ivory black or a Mars black? Or black. Black, which, black. And then I use... Which, which, I'm sorry, which black? Ivory. Ivory, okay. Yeah. And I've got three specialty colors that are kind of my own for my work. And that is uh, King's Blue, Phthalo Green, and uh, Brown Matter or uh, Transparent Red Oxide. Right. Something like that. Thalo green. Let's have the little thalo green discussion. Yeah. How, how come? Um, it's, so, like saying, it's like saying it's a little plutonium in my knapsack here. Oh, but you'd be surprised. At night, it's a perfect green because uh, there's not much yellow in it. It's a dark and it's green without yellow. So uh, even though there probably is some yellow, but compared to uh, middle green or standard green, uh, it's very dark without yellow. And so, uh, for instance, that painting that you initially started with, which was uh, the one of Wilson's 
Yeah. The last waitress. There was a yellow light. And as I moved away from that light, I went into my yellowy phthalo. We'll go right to it. Yeah. There's phthalo in that green glow around that light. And even darker phthalo as I move out into the sky. This is a dark photograph, by the way. There's a little more color in that sky than what you see. Okay. But the phthalo, the greens in those darks are phthalo. Interesting. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and so they're really not that garish, right, in a dark scene. Right. I put those in a day scene. You've got to know what you're doing to use phthalo in a day scene because it's it looks unnatural. It's so bright. And... Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, it, 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 and it's just that it's such a powerful dye color. Right. I just you see it overtake. It's like dioxazine purple. Uh, you're really in that pastel end of colors in the light. You can get away with using some phthalo, it, you know, make it almost white with a little bit of yellow. It'll just read as a very bright, you know, yellow tinged grass or something. Wow. But the minute you get any chroma in that in the day, it gets to be unnatural. Right. Right. Well, it's it's your your, your use of it is inspiring. So. All right. Tell us about this one, sir. All right. Florida sky. Um, so we already showed that small plein air piece earlier of the west coast of Florida. Oh, well, we have wait, wait, interruption, interruption. We have a technical question here. Mm -hmm. Lily's asking, Basari makes a phthalo blue green shade. Is that too blue? Do you have any idea? Um, I've used phthalo blue before, and actually that works well in uh, ocean water. So I'm sure there's there's places you could easily use phthalo blue green shade, but I don't use it, so I'm not a good one to ask. All right. <laughs> back back to the matter at hand. Another studio piece, because this is right. 36, right? Well, I approached this in the studio the same way I approached the uh, plein air piece on the west coast of Florida. I, I put in kind of a dark silhouette where those uh, grasses are on the beach and then fixed my horizon. And then I went to work on doing the, the sky. And I did the sky exactly like I would in the field. I outlined where the cloud shapes were going to be. I put in that background sky color, which is the orange to yellow to green to blue. And then I was careful to uh, work the color into the clouds the way I wanted them. You notice that near the horizon, there's a little more warmth in those sky colors or in those cloud colors, and then they get cooler as you move away. Um, you lose edges in the distance compared to the more foreground elements of those clouds. The other thing to notice is that um, there's nice perspective in the sky as well as on the ground. So you can, you know, you can really harness some of that sky perspective to, to make things recede in your painting. So. Yeah, to talk about that a little. Is the, is your brushwork in the same? Is your brushwork consonant with the um, with the kind of epic swirl? You know, the, the, the rising. You've got this the huge sky. Yeah. Well, at the end, um, you can kind of see where I kind of dry brush dragged a little bit of color from that top cloud in the direction that the wind was coming from. So I guess that's the only place where I would say that my brushwork really entered in too much. It's more a matter of edges, I think, and I you know, have a lot, a lot of soft edges where the blue meets the the orange, and also a prismatic color change. You notice it doesn't go from orange to blue; it goes to orange to red to alizarin to blue, and that softens that edge in a color sense, also. I think. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Wow. A lot going on here, sir. A lot going on. <laughs> okay. All right. So another one from Ephraim, Wisconsin, Door County, Plein Air. This was from. And that, well, that's the same. That's Wilson's right down there. Correct. Yes. Wilson's at yeah. the bottom right or middle bottom right. And uh, so I, when I pulled into Door County for that event, my host family lives in Ephraim. So I drove by that scene. And I was just so in awe of that dusk color in the sky. And I was tempted to go start painting, but of course we don't stamp our panels till the next day, which we did. And I went back that next night and it was an identical sky. And uh, I painted it again, uh, the, the ground plane and the upright planes, those I put in as a silhouette ahead of time. And then when the correct 
time period occurred at night, which was after the sun went down and I got the colors I wanted. Then I put the sky in as fast as I could. I always match the water up with the sky at the same time because those two have to be congruous. And then I really had all night to do some of the glare or some of the halos around the light sources on the ground, like around Wilson's and the, the headlights and so forth, because those don't change much over the next couple hours. Interesting. Interesting. So, so a lot of what you're talking about is knowing when is the appropriate time to work on the various aspects of the picture. Exactly. There's a lot of timing component to it. And the other thing that most people don't do that when I do a workshop, I insist they bring, if I'm doing sunset, to bring a night, uh, a nocturne light. And I will turn my light on as it gets near sunset. And by the time sun is down, I'm not even thinking about it, but I'm still seeing my image clearly enough to keep adding paint. And I think most people, pretty soon they can't see what they're doing because it's so dark. So yeah, it helps to have a light on as you're doing this. Well, I suppose if we're celebrating our nerdiness, is there a particular type of nocturne light you find superior to all others? <clears throat> well, um, I have a good friendship with a guy in California who makes lights for a company called Art Escape. It's artescape.us. He's got many different uh, styles, but two basic styles. And uh, you can adjust the warmth and the coolness of the light and the um, and the intensity. And at the same time, it's very lightweight and attaches very firmly to almost any easel. So that's what I'm using. All right. If we had Betty Sue here, she would be putting that on a banner and throwing it up on the screen. But we don't have her. So All right. artist. Have, they'll just have to watch this part of it again. Okay. Uh, look. Now, hey, one question. Yeah, wow. One thing, Charlie, and that is that if you go on Amazon, you can find some piano lights for 30 bucks that are actually not too bad. So Really? Okay. Yeah, so you don't have to have the an expensive light necessarily. So how long on the ones that your your friend makes, how long does it, I assume they're their battery? Yeah, there's a five hour battery on them. Five hour, okay. Yeah, rechargeable. Cool. Yeah. I love that. This one really does remind me of Joe Paquette, I, I will say. There's, there's yeah. a pretty aspect yeah. to it. Um, so, in, you know, with Joe, he had a, a way of teaching where you start out with an underpainting uh, so you can march your darks back correctly. And then you add color later. And I, I do a lot of that to this day, especially for tree. Trees, as they recede, the shadow parts will become uh, lighter and bluer as you go back, typically, and a little more color in the foreground trees. So this was um, quintessential Fish Creek in Door County. There's these cute little houses down by the water uh, and the big Midwestern trees. And uh, foreground element here, the cars with the little hedge row next be behind them. So it had everything I wanted. It had some color interest. It had some gradation from front to back. It had a car for scale. And uh, yeah, that's it. And well, and, it, and it's got, I mean, I think that's a Ford Bronco over there on the right. So that <laughs> has associative memories for people who like Ford Broncos. And the, yeah. th the thing I like about this is that it it is it harmonizes even though You've, your color worlds of your man-made structures are so disparate. The paint to the teal to the, the white. You know? yeah. You're asking me about phthalo green. Well, one place you can use it during the day is if you have an unnatural object in your natural painting, like a car or a weird color on a house. I think that, that house had some manganese blue, maybe a little phthalo green. But, you know, we associate that with something unnatural. So it worked out fine. Right. Really nice, nice piece. Thanks. And uh, an interior now. So. Yeah, I'm a fan of interiors. I don't do a lot of them. But um, again, I think it comes down to seeing how light drops off away from an uh, artificial light source and creates glow in certain areas. Um, I like I like some mystery in my work, and I think nocturne, or nocturnes and interiors allow for a lot of mystery. 
you can just see some vague shapes over on the right. Those are people sitting there, but uh, you'd have to look real hard to know. Right. You still get a sense of it. It's something something going on there. Um, two dominant light sources here. One, of course, over the table and the other on that fish on the right. And I'd like to play off between those two a little bit. Um, the, the passage from the light over the table to the light on the fellers closest to us hair. Yeah. Uh, I think that, that works magnificently well. Yeah, that was that hair is almost the same brightness as the light source itself. Yeah. Really like, nice. You don't quite get there. I mean you've got it the brightest thing will always be the light source. So you could even have a mirror on that table and it's got to be down in value. Oh, from the, in that, fact the mirror on the back wall um right that has the light source, right? Yeah, yeah it's the light source. Now, and where, where, where is just out of curiosity? Is this in Florida or no oh, lobster trap? Uh, yeah. This is another one that'll this will be for the um, Wild Side Art Show, Catalina Island Conservancy oh. again this year, and this is in Avalon, uh, California, on Catalina Island, and it's it's kind of a locals joint. And every time I go, I go into this this restaurant bar and eat. So. Neat. It's a kind of a fan favorite for the island, I think. That's cool. Now, there's in the comments, there's a little discussion. Someone asking about the company name of the light you use, but Kelvin actually found it. So okay. it's Art Escape, Art Escape US, correct? Art Escape US, correct. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Kelvin. Appreciate Thanks. that. And the final slide, the final slide takes us to the incipient holiday season. I put this in. It wasn't quite done, but it's it's not going to look that much different when I finish it. Uh, but this is Minnesota in December. This is a kind of a classic suburb view. Uh, and I had a friend who, had, who lived near this spot. And at night, our wives and I, we'd walk out after a snowstorm and see this kind of stuff right after Christmas, I think. So the lights are still out, but there's not a lot going on. Uh, but I don't know, this This I can just work on for hours, trying to get that exact prismatic shift and light drop off away from a light source, like in that little portico share or that little porch area. And then away from the, the small light bulbs in the tree. And, and if you look at the string of colored lights in the foreground, each one of those has a little halo around them, very subtle. But that's what makes it look like a glowing light. Right. Well, the, the thing I love about this is the harshness of the street lamp. Yeah. Juxtaposed with the light on the snow, the color transition between those two cars, yeah. if you go from between those two cars to the, to the house, the way that you move, that you are seeing color is just so delicious. Mm. You know, I just that is magnificent painting. Well, that was a, a good um, example of trying to balance color with neutrals, and it's something Joe Paquette has always talked about. But uh, this one, there's a, the color wouldn't be as beautiful if you didn't have a lot of neutral color around it. Right. Wow, it's that's 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 terrific painting. Thank terrific you. painting. All right. Well that's a quick a quick tour through the magnificence that is Carl Bretsky. What do you got coming up? Anything you need to flog, Carl? Or uh, is it well um, yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff coming. Um, I've got a two man show out in Sag Harbor, New York in the Hamptons. That's October fifteenth. October 22nd is that Wild Side Art Show in Newport Beach, California. I've got a couple of plein air events. Um, Laguna Invitational is early October. Ram Marais plein air invitational local event. That's end of September. I'm going to do the Lighthouse plein air event again in March. I don't know. I, I know I'm forgetting a bunch of them, but that's 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 pretty busy now. Normally, normally I would have put up. I would have in the few minutes before we go live. I would have put up, created a banner that says for more information, CarlBretsky.com. But because we were having our technical issues, I didn't get around to that. What what's your website, Carl? 
carlbretsky.com. Whoa, what are the odds? So just take my name and add a .com and you're there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carl. It's been terrific talking with you, and I look forward to painting with you down the road. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks, Charlie. Good to all see right. you again. Good all to right. see you. And thank you all for watching the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. We, we won't be here next week. I've got to go do – got to teach in Michigan. That's it. But then I'll be back after that. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.